Podcast. Welcome to Mac and Blue, the cutting edge podcast for the nation's builders, merging the realms of construction with exciting advancements in technology. Join us on a thrilling journey where we delve into the dynamic world of blockchain, AI, the metaverse, virtual and augmented reality, and their transformative impact on the industry. Our engaging discussions span a wide spectrum, covering not only construction, economic development, supply chain, and market segments, but also exploring the vibrant tapestry of diversity within the construction landscape. We shed light on the intersection of local politics and its profound influence on the construction sector, while championing the remarkable contributions of women and minorities in construction. For all things Mac and Blue, head to www.macandblue.com, and don't forget to subscribe on YouTube. I'm your host, JJ Levinsky. Now let's get into it. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Mac and Blue. I'm your host, JJ Levinsky, CEO and co-founder of Blue Wave. Uh, today, I'm lucky enough to have Jim Finowich, uh, the managing partner of IBG, Fox & Finn, also Fox Financial LLC. Uh, Jim is also the past president of the International Business Brokers Association. Correct. And uh, just to kind of set the tone for the audience, off air and throughout the course of, of Mac and Blue over the last year, I've had a ton of people wanted to, to for me to get a guest on to talk about mergers and acquisitions and selling their business and valuation and everything around that because um, for those of us that have been around long enough um, to have, remember the, the recession, a lot of companies have come back from that um, and they're now in a position, whether it's uh, generational, um, equity, you know, capital, whatever, they have the, they have the wherewithal and kind of the, the disposition now to possibly sell. And let's be honest, private equity pretty much knocks on your door every day, and uh, you right. represent a lot more than just private equity. But um, so we thought, great, let's see if Jim can come on. Um, their their company is one of I, one of the highest. Uh, how do I say it? Has one of the highest um, accolades, if you will, in our space in the in the in the market. I was off air. I was telling Jim that I had met um, some folks from his company probably about oh, nine, maybe eight, nine years ago when I first moved to the to the valley, and we were up in the Scottsdale Air Park area. So, so with that, welcome, Jim. Well, thank you, JJ. I appreciate you having me. And yeah. Look forward to providing some information for your audience. <laughs> if nothing else, we can just banter, right? We'll have fun. Yeah. <laughs> um, just j before we get into the nuts mm -hmm. and bolts of what you do. Could you just kind of take a humble approach and kind of go back and how the hell did you ever get in this business? And a little bit about kind of your past. Okay. You know, that's a good question. Uh, you, know, you won the lottery one day and said, hey, this is what I'm going to do. Uh, yeah, I thought, well, if I became a broker, I could win the lottery. <laughs> no. Uh, I am what would probably be called the classic entrepreneur. Okay. Uh, I Last time I worked for anybody else, I was 20 years old. I know I'm unemployable, uh, so I have to work for myself. But between the age of 20 and 34, I owned 14 different businesses. No kidding. Uh, if they had a diagnosis for it back in those days, they would have said I had attention deficit disorder. Oh. But I'd get start. I'd start a business. I'd get it going well, and I'd get bored. Right. I'd buy a business. And You're I'd a local get, guy, though, right? Uh, yep. Gr okay. Grew up in Tucson, so lived in Arizona my whole life. You're so. one of the 20-some percenters then, yeah. <laughs> yep, one of that small percentage of people that were born here. Nice. But after 14 years of operating 14 different businesses, and a lot of them, you know, a lot of overlap there, yeah. I decided what I really like is doing deals more than I did running a business. You know, uh, every business owner I talked to, one of the, one of the challenges is employees. Uh, and I had businesses with a lot of employees. So selling businesses, I got the thrill and excitement of you know, going through a sale process. You know, I think the two happiest days in a business owner's life are the day they buy their business and the day they sell it. And I get to be there for both of them. I hear that for a lot of things, boat owners, car owners, <laughs> and, business and, owners now too. That's <laughs> very true of, of all of those. Yeah. So I, I like the transaction. I like the business of business. You know, every business has a common denominator. Mm -hmm. You know, every business you have to manage people. You have to manage money. Hopefully, there's more coming in than going out. In both in both buckets, people <laughs> and and, yes. and money. Yeah. And so. You have to provide a product or service the public wants at a competitive price. Yeah. And whether you're selling pizzas or airplanes or newspapers or drywall or electrical services or brokerage services, the, the basic business foundation is the same. Right. And so I like being able to analyze a business. What, what makes this one tick? 
why does this drywall company make five million dollars a year and this one make five hundred thousand a year they're both in the same market they're both providing the same product Mm -hmm. so for me that's fun to to dig into so i've now been selling business for over 35 years and i've never gotten bored (laughs) oh it's fun you're still on probation though after 35 years (laughs) yeah i still don't know what i want to be when i grow up but i've I've liked the last 35 years (laughs) best so go back to that that time period when when you decided that you were no longer going to be that operator and when you made this your full-time gig if you will yeah what was it like doing those first few deals was it scary as crap oh you know i have or 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 did it was it just like a roller coaster of emotion it's a roller coaster of emotion you know i i have a friend who's a retired airline pilot okay um flight instructor and he has a saying that if you're not a little bit scared you're not having fun true and i think that's true in business too not just flying right you know yeah it was a little bit scary but uh for adrenaline junkies like me that that little bit of fear kind of drives you on did you have uh and, and again whether it's right at the beginning or just recently Ooh. do you see cycles of of verticals that you play in oh absolutely okay yes there are there are real cycles and arizona is probably one of the best markets to talk about cycles in construction okay uh there's been tremendous cycles in construction in the time i've been here Mm. although i started about the day after dirt was invented so (laughs) there's been a lot of cycles but you know every contractor every business has ups and downs right uh, you know, the, what's happened in construction, we're one of the best growth markets in the country, mm-hmm. but there still are cycles. Mm. And so, you know, talking about selling your business, timing is everything. You know, you want to sell when your business is going up, not when it's coming down. Or not when it plateaus either, right? Right. Yeah. Yep. On the way up is the best time. So what's the best time in the market? Depends on that cycle. Yeah. What other... Um other than construction, what are the other top hot, top verticals that you represent? Let's say in the last eighteen months, um, that we have sold last eighteen months: manufacturing, distribution, yeah. um, IT, SaaS companies, distribution. You know, people ask if we aviation businesses. Mm-hmm. Um, people ask if we specialize in anything, and it's primarily businesses that are profitable. Got it. Um, that in business, I can learn as I talked about to begin with. The basis of the business is the same. Hmm. You gotta be able to read a financial statement. You have to be able to look at a market. Uh, You have to know all the things around it. Uh, But whether it's a you know, construction company or a SaaS company. You know, it's just the end product that's different. Management of the business and position in the market is really the same. Now you're you're national though, right? Uh, yes. We, can you, again, just for the audience sake, Jim, can you just kind of explain how that worked or how you developed that versus starting, you started local, I would assume. Yes. Then how how does it branch out? Again, just for the neophyte, and I don't mean it in a negative context, but yeah. the neophytes that are listening going, well, how, 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 you know, what does, what, what, what market does Jim represent? I'm like, are they brokers? Are they, you know, do they represent sellers, buyers? The answer is yes. And plus everything else in between. Yeah, yeah I would say 70 to 80% of our clients are sellers that we represent. It's mostly on the selling side, okay. Uh, 20 to 30% is buyer representation. Okay. In both cases, we're there to get a deal done. Right. Uh, the difference is when I represent a seller, I want to bring multiple buyers to the table. I want to create a bidding war and I want to politely play one against the other to maximize the selling price and options for my client. When I represent a buyer, I don't want any other buyers involved. I want to get it as cheap as I can. (laughs) Now, I'm still there to get a deal done, but my fiduciary obligation is different whether it's a buyer or a seller. I never represent both at the same time. Makes sense. So how did we end up? Yeah, go back to that. We got off on a couple tangents there, but go back to like, how how were you able to go from a local to more of a national? So we started out as a local firm, right. and we're always looking at how we can maximize the benefits for our clients. 
And if you've got a local business, particularly in Arizona, a lot of your buyers, maybe the majority of them are gonna be from out of state. So we said, we need better sources for our clients. We're gonna maximize it. So a little over 10 years ago, through people I know in a national association. Oh, that's right. We yeah. merged um, uh, four different companies mm. into one national platform. So today we have offices in eight different states. Uh, we have a common database of everybody between those states of buyers of private equity groups of all, all kinds of things. Uh, we share resources. You know, we're a very data-driven business. So we spend $100,000 a year in annual subscriptions just on data. That's easier to do when you divide it up between eight offices than just one. Right. It allows me to have more resources than, frankly, a lot of my competitors. Mm. So we, we created this national platform so that we could share these resources, share expenses, and then it brings expertise from different markets as well. Which makes sense. Uh, um, you know, if you're selling a, a, a gas and oil company, okay. um, I'm a partner in Oklahoma as an expert in gas and oil. Geez, would have never guessed, right? Yeah, <laughs> and uh, all I know is they go in a different hole in a car. But he's the expert at that. Ethan, so. don't mix up the holes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I've got different partners with different expertise. So we'll, they're brought in on a deal if we have something that takes particular industry expertise. So that helps give us a broader reach, give us more resources, and in the end, do more to help our clients. Yeah. The more resources I have, the better it's going to be for my client. And then several years ago, we found we were getting some buyers internationally. Oh, really? Uh, there are people that want to be in the United States. Yeah. And there are U.S. companies that their markets are outside the United States. So these aren't partners, but we formed an affiliation with an international group called Eaton Square. Okay. And Eaton Square, uh, we have partners in 11 different countries and I think 26 different cities right now. So if I get a, I had a deal where we did our research and we found an Australian company would have been a good buyer for this. Mm. So I called my partner in Australia and I said, hey, I, can you help me work on this? I've identified this, this company here in Australia. I think it'd be a good fit. I said, do you know anything about them? And he said, actually, I went to high school with the president of that company. You've got to be kidding me. No, I know. Sometimes it's better to be lucky than smart. Yeah, no kidding. Uh, but, you know, we were, we were lucky. Yeah. Uh, so we have those international connections where they apply. That makes sense. And that just gets us more well, choice. It, it, it makes sense with the global market. I mean, when I think back, a lot of people that have sat in your chair, um, I think back to um, uh, Glenn, who represented... Uh, you may even know him you know he's very active in all the canadian and the mining industry and all that stuff yes and so we were talking both on air and off air of just how free-flowing the capital is between like mexico canada here and let's be honest china too yes you know everyone listen everyone that doesn't think this all that investment in northern mexico has chinese money written all over it because they're like hey we're just one step closer to the doorstep of the u.s it's not it's economics. It's not rocket science. Nope. They <laughs> want to be where the money's going, yep. and a lot of it is Mexico. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So anyway, um, uh, okay. Tangent. Um, before we get into what I call the nuts and bolts of why a lot of people want me to ask you the tougher questions of the process, I do want to qualify some things though. When, when, because there's so many people. Well, I shouldn't say that. How do I'm going to phrase this carefully? is your industry, sometimes it's not just brokerage. Sometimes there's cross-contamination of where, uh, let's say I was wanting to sell my business or I come to you and go, Jim, I'm interested in selling. And then in our due diligence, you go, JJ, you don't want to sell, you want to raise capital to, for Correct. growth's sake. Um, how, how do people differentiate between brokerage and investment banking and, 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 and you know representing those different capital stacks? Like where do you guys draw the line versus maybe a competitor of yours? Sure, uh, very good question, JJ. Yeah. You know, I would say there's three broad categories of people that sell businesses. Okay. 
Main Street business brokers uh, that are selling smaller companies, restaurants. What, what's gas typically stations. is there like a cap to that? Do you think? You know, it's or just give me a range so the audience uh, knows. I would say up to a couple million dollars. Okay. okay, got it. Main Street brokerage. Got it. And but and then on the far end of the scale are Wall Street investment banking firms. Yeah. And they don't like doing deals under three or four hundred million. Got it. My firm, M and A Advisor, we're, we're in the middle between the two. You know, we in our firm we typically don't represent companies with a transaction value less than five million dollars. Which would make sense uh, with your maturity. Yeah. 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 And we we started out doing Main Street business brokerage of many years ago. And I, I decided I wanted to sell bigger companies where everybody'd have clean financial statements and realistic expectations of value and wouldn't be emotional about the sale. And I was only wrong about all three all, of them. I was going to say, yeah, uh, you said it, not me. <laughs> yeah, I was wrong about all three. But <laughs> so we're that mid market. Okay. You know, we're, we're in, we bring investment banking process and procedure from Wall Street down downstream to uh, local smaller businesses okay so we're, we're the middle guy do you okay well let's just let's just dive in okay so let's say let, let's go back to your drywall example because it's an easy okay. one let's say you get a, a referral or a lead on a drywall company okay. walk us through the whole process right through the nitty-gritty through your eyes Okay. Because there's so many people that are watching and listening going, oh, this, this is appropriate for me. I want to, I want to, I want an educ uh, maybe a, a mini MBA from Jim on this podcast. Okay. And that's a lot of what we do in the process is just educate people as right. to the process, as to the value. And then as you go, I'll, I'll try to throw you curveballs. So, you know, thinking cool. like a business owner. So let's just, let's just role okay. play with this. Okay. So you come to me and you say you want to sell your business. Okay. So we're going to start out with a conversation. Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask you all about the business. I need to understand it. You know, uh, what do you do? Who are your clients? What's your market area? I'm going to ask questions to find the good, bad, and ugly. And there is in every business. If you don't see all three of them, you aren't you're, looking. You're liar, like, and you're a liar, too. Yeah, yeah you're yeah. not looking close enough if you don't see them all. So we decide, are we the right match for you? Are okay. we the right firm for you? Do I have the bandwidth right now to handle you? You know, we work on a limited number of transactions. So when the plate's full, we can't take somebody on. When a deal doesn't feel right, is it more the good, the bad, and the ugly, or is it just personality? It's several things. Personality is one of them. I would think it's a big one. Uh, it is. And it's the hardest conversation to have, going, hey, you're an asshole. I can't work with you. Yeah, or maybe you think that about me. But, you know, I Quid pro people, quo, right? <laughs> yeah, it is. You know, we, we both agree, you know. We, we both describe each other the same way. Yeah. You know, but you get the chips on the table early. Yeah. You yeah. Do. Well, you know, when you start out, when we're talking about going to market, this is probably the biggest transaction in your life, you know, that you want to make sure you have a person you feel comfortable with. Mm -hmm. And I'll say to someone, if we don't like each other on the first date, we're going to hate each other yeah. when we're married. Yeah. So let, let's just stop dating and move on. We actually turned down three out of four people that come to us and ask us to help them selling their business. I'm glad you said that. Because that's perfect. Repeat it. Three out of yep. four. Three out of four we turned down. Now, next question is why? Well, I had a call just before I came here. Really nice couple. Mm -hmm. Had a business. But it's too small for me. Right. You know, they, they're just not the right size. I've now, seen, I assume you pay it forward to back to the main. Oh, you yeah. have this whole constituency of Main Street brokers that you can go here, call oh, Bob or yeah. Cliff or Susie, and they'll take care of you. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I've again, I've been here in this market a long time. Certain kind of business, I'll go to a certain broker. Got it. But I'll spend 30 minutes to an hour with somebody mm -hmm. determining what their business is, what the challenges are giving them some value. I want everybody that talks to me, even if they don't become a customer, to walk away and say, I got something out of that encounter. So it may be a referral to the right broker. Mm -hmm. So size may be one thing. You know, as I said, we're just not compatible. No. That, that's another reason. A lot of times they're not ready to sell. Ooh, define that a little bit. 
Okay, the time to sell a business is when three stars are aligned, when it's the right time in the market, when it's the right time for the owner, and when it's the right time for the business. Now, today is the right time in the market for construction companies and, and a lot of other companies. And a lot too. of other, yeah, okay. Uh, most any company, it's a good time in the market. You, know, you talk about the recession, what happened to companies then? That was not the time to sell. Uh, you know, you need to wait till it's the right time in the market. The owner has to be ready too. Mm. You know, when, when an owner sells a business, it's like giving your child up for adoption. You know it's time to kick the kid out of the house, but you still want him to have a good home. So, people, Ethan, we're not talking about you, so don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know his dad, so it's fun. Uh, well, okay. If he ever if he watches this, he'll laugh at it. Good. <laughs> so, you know, I, I think people start out thinking about thinking about selling their business, and then they think about maybe doing something about it. Yeah. And then they start exploring maybe doing something about it. It can be a multi-year process from when you start thinking about time to kick the kid out of the house till you actually are you know, kid-free. Yeah. Uh, Let me interrupt you there. Okay. Because I think we need to humble everyone. Hmm. I know you can't define it in an exact average but w from the time someone first talks to you till a deal is done and closed, what would that average duration time be? 12 months from our first serious conversation. Now, ideally, we like to talk with people two or three years in advance. Right. Uh, you know, I said the third leg of that stool is when it's the right time for the business. Mm -hmm. Well, you sell a business, it's like selling a house. You put a coat of paint on it first. You mow the lawn, you trim the bushes. With a business, you clean up financial statements as well as many other things. And I'll give you just one example of that. One benefit of owning a small business is that you can write things off occasionally that aren't totally necessary for the business. Um, you know, and I would call those gray dollars. Mm -hmm. So you know, I, I know an owner of a business, he has three kids in college, and they're all on his payroll. Imagine how that works. And I've never seen him in the business, yeah. but they're on his payroll. So, so let's call those gray dollars. So I'll say to a business owner, for every gray dollar, you're saving yourself like 35 cents in tax. They go, that's right. I'm saving 35 cents on every one of those dollars. And I'll say, yeah, and do you realize we're gonna sell your business for about four times earnings? So for every dollar you save 35 cents on, you give up $4 in sale price. Now let me get out the big calculator. 35 cents, four bucks. I want you to go home, JJ, and do something, maybe considered un-American. I want you to pay all the tax you possibly can because we're gonna sell your business for a lot more money if we clean up those gray dollars before we go to market. And there's lots of other things you add do. Addbacks, whatever else, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Th those are addbacks. Yeah. You know, I, I had a construction company where the owner had a company vehicle. And, and you see construction companies, yeah. owners usually drive a pickup truck. This one drove a Ferrari. Now, I don't know how many bags of cement you can put in the passenger seat of a Ferrari, but I, I, that's one that we probably could uh, take off the books and add to the bottom line. Yeah. There comes a time when dreams become a reality, when you see your vision materialize into a true work of art. And the only way to get there is to choose a general contractor who shares that same vision and knows how to bring it to life. At Blue Wave, we aren't so big that we've forgotten where we've come from. And we aren't so small that we can't care for your projects regardless of their size. When your vision deserves safety, perfection, timeliness, and expertise in order to become a reality, trust Blue Wave to get it done right the first time. Thank you for going down that. In that, let me, let's go back to your three pillars. Okay. The market, the owner, the business. Mm -hmm. Is it a, I'm, I'm gonna pose this as assumptions and then you, you correct me. 
typically I would think most people come to you when the market is right or they think it's going to be right. They as owners think they're ready, but maybe not be ready. But I think you kind of gave us a look under the hood. My guess is that most of them, the reason it takes a year to 16 months is back to when you want, because they'll go, hey, Jim, what can I get? And and you go, well, um, I'll use it something like, well, let's get four to six multiple on, on mm-hmm. earn, you know, on EBITDA or whatever it is. And then he go, well, that's great. The market's right. You're, you're, you're not perfect, but you're, you know, whatever. You're in the 70, 80 percentile of being ready to sell as the owners, but your business is below 50% because of X, Y, and Z. You know, your yep. financials aren't right. You haven't done an audited this. You haven't done that. Back to what you were saying. And we've got to clean this up. Is that, is that a lot of times what takes that extra time is to clean the business up? Yes. Okay. That's why we like to talk with people a couple of years in advance. Okay. You know, you, you've, got to, you've got to do those things more than the day before you're going to market. Right. But I think it's important to talk a little bit about the owner, too. Go ahead. Are they ready with you know, a majority of businesses that I see, the owner's identity is the business. I, I know that is with me. I've done this business for over 35 years. You're the brand. Uh, I am. That now. I, I mean, yeah, I see. I know you have partners, but. But, you know, over time, I've got to work myself out of that role. Mm-hmm. Um, I've got to do that. But what do I see myself doing after the sale? One qualifying question. I'm you know, giving your audience an internal yeah, yeah. tip here, but <laughs> one qualifying question I ask an owner is, if I sell your business tomorrow, what are you gonna do the next day? And if they don't have a clear answer of what they're going to do, you and something other than play golf, yeah, uh, something other than play golf, if they don't know what they're gonna do afterwards, they may not sell that business no matter what offer they get. They'll let me spend a thousand hours on it. I'll get down to the end. I'll get a really good offer. And I go, man, what am I going to do with my life? So you need to think about life after that business. You know, I, I, I remember a gentleman sold a, a very large business for him, really successful, came back to me six months later and said, I want to buy a business. And I said, what, you know, we just got millions of dollars for this. And you know, why? And he said, I'm bored. My, and I, he said, I'm bored. And he said, my wife told me I married you for life, but not lunch every day. Now get out of the house. <laughs> oh. I love it. So what's your life look like? If you don't have a picture of that, you may not be ready. So got to look in the mirror and say, can I make this transition? Now, I've had clients or potential clients that I would bet money they're going to die in the business. They're not going to do anything different. And that's where they want to die. I mean, they don't say it. Hey, you want to go to the office and die today. But they can't see themselves doing anything else. And that's fine. Just recognize it. And it sounds morbid, Jim, but I think you and I have been around long enough to see this is back to the scenario you just gave. I'm just thinking of an example of, I had a conversation in the parking lot before you got here. Guy did that, he sold it, and guess what? He died this, in the last few months, he died. Yep. And it was it was a sad story. You know, yep. it's almost like selling his business, like he lost his family, his kids, and it almost like he, was, he died of heart failure, liter- almost figuratively and literally, you know? And that's sad to hear. Yeah, and that's just, you know, human nature. Everybody has yeah. to look at where I'm at, where I want to be, and what the transition is. Right. Everybody, everybody will leave their business eventually. Mm-hmm. The only question yeah. is, is it horizontal or vertical? Yeah. What are the, um, instead of going down the cautionary side, let, let's stay on the, on the business owner side. Okay. What are some of the most successful attributes you've seen from the owners that had the most successful sales? in that preparation? Is that a fair question? Uh, that's a fair question. Yeah, I, I think, and I may digress slightly, but I'll, hopefully I'll answer Go the ahead. question. You have to look at a business as a living, breathing entity of its own, okay. regardless of who the owner is. And in its time to change the owner, that shouldn't necessarily change the business. You know, um, I, I see a business where the owner does 90% of the sales. They have all the customer relationships. A buyer is going to want that owner to stay on for two or three years after the sale. With all uh, the earnouts and everything else. Yeah. 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 So you need to 
the best way to sell a business is work yourself out of a job mm -hmm. so that the business can go on on its own without you. And some businesses can't. You know, I, I remember sitting down with a seller of a business once and a buyer, and the seller was very proud of his, his business and his devotion to it. And he said, I work six and a half, seven days a week. I haven't taken a vacation in seven years. That's how devoted I am to this business. And the buyer left. I said, are you trying to talk him into buying it or talk him out of buying it? So let me tell you a meeting I had with that buyer and another business owner last week. Business buyer said, well, tell me about your involvement in the business. He said, oh yeah, I, I work in the business 10, 15 hours a week. Uh, he said, now I got a house up in Flagstaff. You know, half the time I'm working from up there. Uh, I take about three months vacation a year. My wife and I like to travel internationally. I get a good manager that takes it over, but you know, I can oversee it kind of from everywhere I'm at. Mm -hmm. Now, as a buyer, JJ, you want you want the business where the guy hasn't taken a vacation in seven years? Probably not. No, you don't. So put yourself in the buyer's shoes. You know, if you, knowing what you know about your business, if you were buying it, what would concern you? And eliminate those concerns before you go to market. That's a. I think that was very well stated and, and worth repeating. Is what's well, like anything like in any negotiation always think of the person in the other seat, right? Yep, exactly. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and put your, your bias aside. Yeah. If you were going to buy it, what would you want? You know, people all the time say, oh, the company has lots of potential. You know, I should get extra money because of this potential. And I'll say, no, people, the value people pay for a business is based upon history. Mm -hmm. They buy it for potential. If there's no potential, they're not going to buy it. No. So yeah, potential is important, but it has to be real. It has to be measurable. And those are the things, some of the things you need to do ahead of time, you know? So I mentioned cleaning up the financial statements, mentioned sales all being the owner, start transferring those relationships over. Some customer, some business sales uh, have employees that the buyers want to have a non-compete agreements. Mm. Do you have a non-compete agreement from your employees? You've got managers that are, now you take the good business where the managers are running. As the buyer, I'm going to go, man, that manager's running that business for him. What if he leaves? What's going to happen to me? Do you have a non-compete agreement with him? What, what kind of contract? Good and I got to tell you, it's much better to go to your managers and get employment agreements, non-compete agreements, when there isn't a buyer at the door. You know, get it done in advance. There you go, audience. Listen to that one. So think, think in advance. You know what? Uh, you're going to go through due diligence. Uh, someone, it may be a stock sale rather than an asset sale. True. Um, I had one recently where the buyer said, okay, I'm buying the stock, but I need copies of your corporate minute books. And uh, the client called me and said, hey, do you have an attorney? I'm a little behind on my corporate minutes. I said, what do you mean a little behind? He said, about 20 years. <laughs> oh, you, you want someone to go back and make 20 years of, hey, that doesn't work. No. You know, are those things up to date? Uh, you, know, uh, you have a complaint filed against you. Hmm. Um, I, I had one guy said, you know, he did some checking and they've got a lawsuit. And I said, well, I, I, what, tell me about this lawsuit. Oh, it's you a mean, bunch of. You mean it didn't come up till due, dil due diligence? No, no, oh. this, is, this is when we're starting. Oh, okay, okay. And, uh, but this Cause I was when, like, holy crap, how does someone, like, hey, come on, you gotta talk about that before. Yeah, we, we, yeah. we have to talk about those things up front. That, yeah. That's part of my due diligence as a broker before I take them on as a client. Got it. But I said, okay, so tell me about this lawsuit. Oh, it's a bunch of crap, the guy's full of it, they'll never get anything, don't worry about it. And I said, well, no, a no. buyer is going to worry about it. I could settle that for next to nothing in a heartbeat. Well, then go do it. <laughs> yeah, then go do it. You know, let, let's get this out of the way. You know, as a buyer, JJ, what, what business would you buy? The one that said, yeah, I just settled this lawsuit or, or the one that don't worry after you buy it, it'll get settled. <laughs> yeah, we know. Yeah, take care of those things to begin with. So on that business side, you've talked about the financials and any let's call it just things on the periphery. 
What are the other biggest items you see, on, back to those three pillars, on the business side of the cleanup that typically you, how do I just say this? Because you're always trying to be nice, but you have to be blunt to the, the yes. people. Like, all right, I'm going to use Bob's easy. Bob, you know, your, your financials are good. Um, yes, you've transferred sales, but hey, these three things have to be cleaned. What are some of those other things that owners just don't think about that have to be cleaned up? So obviously financials is a big one. Right. Um, I mentioned what the owner does, but let me get, go a little deeper okay. in that. What's your bench look like? You know, what's second level of management in the company? Mm. Do you have a good management structure? Do you have a deep bench? Uh, if you're not there, who can take over things? Uh, so that you're not totally dependent on that owner for a, a number of reasons, you know, legal things I've touched on, mm. uh, but relationships with your clients. You know, one of the biggest concerns is customer concentration. Mm. Uh, you know, does one customer amount to 90% of your business? Now, if you're a buyer and you look at that and say, if I lose one customer, 90% of my business is gone. And that's a difficult one sometimes. Mm. You know, you get a good customer, they provide a lot, but you need to diversify that. Otherwise, it's going to affect what you're paid and how you're paid. Um, do you have contracts with your customers? Do you have contracts with your suppliers? Sometimes those are very important. Uh, do you have backups to your backups? You know, you import a lot of goods, a lot of product from overseas. Mm. You know, go back to 2020. What happened to imports? Things dropped off. Do you have a secondary source? That's important. That's a, <coughs> that's a really good point, Jim. How, how does the typical buyer look at um, succession planning? Is that a, a, a positive or a negative? And let me, let me qualify it. Because this is going to get, you know, you, well, let's get into the nepotism issue that always comes up, right? Yes. Hey, I got a succession plan. Well, it's really not a succession plan. Giving it to Junior and, and Junior S, who are not qualified to be in the business, is not a succession plan, right? Yeah. Do you, do you encounter a lot of that? Uh, we do. Yeah. You know what? A lot of times I see owners that want their children to take over the business. Mm -hmm. And I get the children alone. And they don't want it. They won't, yeah. They're, they're there because they're helping their parents. Yeah. Uh, they think they are. And the parents want them to, to take over the business. That's so kind of like two white lies. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, they don't want to be there, and they don't really want them to be there either. I, I, another broker, a friend of mine, told an interesting story of business he's working on. And he talked with the owner and about his children taking over the business. Mm -hmm. And uh, this got real complicated. In this case, he actually hired an industrial psychologist mm. that went in and interviewed them. And there, there were two sons. And the first son uh, worked in the business, uh, both sons worked in the business, but one had a particular job. It makes no difference what it was. Right. Uh, and he, this dad really liked him and he thought he was the guy to take over the business. The other son, he called the rock star because the guy liked playing a guitar and doing all that foolish crap. And he didn't think that, that he, he, I don't think he even liked that son that much. So <laughs> son number one is gonna take over the business. Well, psychologist came in, interviewed him. Son number one, the golden haired child, was the least qualified to run the business. Doesn't surprise me. Uh, but he was dad's favorite. Right. And the one that dad, we didn't even call him by his name, just the rock, the guitar guy, dude. Uh, he <laughs> the, was the most qualified to do it. Isn't that amazing? Uh, and it was just the father's prejudice. Yeah. Uh, so get the right person there. Uh, sometimes, uh, you know, people come to me and say, hey, would you help me put together a deal to sell to my children, right. sell to my son, my daughter, whoever. And, and sometimes we do that. Right. Uh, but what I tell them is they're going to feel entitled because they're related. They think they ought to get it cheaper. They ought to get it for no money down and a hundred year mortgage with 1% interest or, or something absurd. In a 20 year earn out. <laughs> yes. And, and all of that. So sell it to your kids. That's fine. 
but get outside financing. Because yeah. I can tell you when you're the bank, now you're counting on that money for your retirement. And when things get tough, they're gonna come to you and say, Dad, oh, you know, when you're gonna have a long sob story and it's gonna end with, so I'm gonna miss this month's payment. Uh, and then turns into? Two months and three months and four months. And so you want to make sure yeah. that they're gonna do what they're supposed to. And being responsible to someone on the outside, now, and, and I'm gonna go off on a tangent here, for, but, you know, people think of a sale as all or none. And today, 70% of what we do you know, are our buyers we work with in this size category is to private equity. Mm -hmm. Private equity likes to have ownership maintained. So you want to sell your business to your son, stick him with a $15 million mortgage and you know all, all the stuff that goes with it. Well, Let's bring in a partner. Let's bring in a private equity group. Give your son 30% of the business. Let the private equity group own 70%. They're going to provide the cash, the guarantees. Your son isn't going to be on the hook. And he's probably going to be better off having an experienced partner and not the huge financial burden if he did it himself. True. So sometimes a partial sale makes sense. Uh, not, not just in the case of family, you know, I, businesses get to certain plateaus. So, you know, so you got a manufacturing business grown real well. And, and now you're to the point to keep this business growing. You have to go out and buy $5 million worth of more equipment. stuff. Yeah. stuff. Uh, so you go to the bank, the bank says, fine, we will take a mortgage on your home, on your business, on your firstborn child, on a couple body parts. Mm -hmm. And uh, now you've got a personal guarantee for another 10 years and you're risking it all over again. At that point, sometimes it's better to bring in someone like private equity. Uh, you, can't, you won't have to sign a personal guarantee. They'll provide the financing. They will grow the business with their money, but you participate in it. Typical private equity transaction is about a 70-30 split. Typical private equity company owns a business five years and then resells it. Mm -hmm. In many cases, my clients have gotten more for the 30% five years down the road than they got for the 70% to begin with. Take some tips off the table, de-risk it, and have a deep pocket partner to help you build that. So sometimes there's more than just one way of selling a business. And that can be whether it's with your children, yourself, an outside party, whoever it is, you know, and that's part of coming to a broker like us is we'll look at something and say, you know, here's your options. Mm. You know, we can sell 100%, we can sell 70%. And in some cases we say, you know, I've only got one recommendation for you. It's the name of a bankruptcy attorney. Mm. Uh, you know, that that's probably your best option today. Now, I don't like saying that, but no. sometimes that's the case. Yeah. There comes a time when dreams become a reality, when you see your vision materialize into a true work of art. And the only way to get there is to choose a general contractor who shares that same vision and knows how to bring it to life. At Blue Wave, we aren't so big that we've forgotten where we've come from, and we aren't so small that we can't care for your projects regardless of their size. When your vision deserves safety, perfection, timeliness, and expertise in order to become a reality, trust Blue Wave to get it done right the first time. What is the, um, you, you, you dove into the PE market a little bit. If you had to guess, again, in the, in the cycles that we're in right now, how much of it is typically PE versus, let's say, a, a true strategic uh, on, the, on the buyer side? 80% PE. Still PE, yeah. Yeah, but I think the best buyer 
is a private equity group, in a lot of cases, the best buyer is a private equity group that owns a strategic. There you go. Okay, so thanks for qualifying that. They have explain the, that. Explain that to the audience through your lens versus mine. Okay, so a strategic is someone that may be in the business. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'll give you an example, and this is years ago, so I can I can mention. Yeah, there's that. no secrets anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> go ahead. It, it was a company that distributed copper pipe. Okay. Uh, now, copper is a commodity. The more you buy, the cheaper the price. So we found a copper pipe distributor in California that wanted a footprint in Arizona. Okay. They buy the distributor here. Now they combine their purchases and the cost of their copper went down several percent. Mm -hmm. Now that's several points to the bottom line. That's a strategic buyer. Strategic is when two and two equals five. Mm -hmm. Private equity uh, is just funds that are put together, get money from banks, private individuals, insurance companies, every place they can. Everybody that's got a flush balance sheet, basically. Yep. Yeah. And they, they combine their money. They hire professionals that know how to acquire build, grow businesses, bring talent in, uh, and they come in and they will build a business. They'll consolidate businesses. Mm -hmm. They make money on arbitrage. Yeah. And, uh, and I'll give you an example of that. So you buy a business that makes a million dollars. It's a widget business. And a widget business making a million dollars is gonna sell for a multiple of five. So that million dollar business they paid five million for. Now they find 10 companies like that. They all make a million dollars. They pay 5 million for each one. Now they combine those and they have one company making $10 million. But $10 million is gonna sell for a multiple of seven instead of a multiple of five. So by combining those, they just made $20 million. Now, when they combine them, there's the synergies we just talked about. So that 10 million over a couple of years turns into 15 million. And now at 15 million, they're gonna sell for a multiple of eight. So just by combining that arbitrage makes them a boatload of money mm -hmm. if they do it right. But Private Thank equity groups are like anybody else. There's no. good ones and there's bad ones. Well, it's like any industry, right, Jim? Yeah. Yep, exactly. All right. Thank you for helping explain that. Let me um, just want to be con conscious of the time because it goes fast. I uh, wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't say, Jim, help the audience understand the monetization of your business. In other words, and we don't have to, you won't have to go super granular, but just talk about how the, t the typical structures that are out there, like retainer, um, exclusivity, usually, you know, like they, ca they can't go to another broker where they're engaged with you. Correct. And then based on the sale, there's, you know, some, some of them are flat, some of them are graduated. Can you kind of help explain to the audience how it typically works? Uh, yes. Yeah. Our, in our industry, we work on exclusive agreements. Okay. You know, we, we may, I may have a thousand hours into something right. and you know, I, I don't want that. It's not free. Yeah. No, <laughs> it's not, it goes on, but it's not in their best interest. And I'll, I'll come back to yeah. that as well. Not in mine or in the sellers, believe it or not. You know, we are paid in two ways. One is a retainer to begin with, yeah. uh, which we just consider that a commitment fee. I want someone yeah. committed to the business. Yeah. Uh, so we'll get a retainer, but most of our, and, and that retainer is gonna vary depending on the scope of work. Now, how much is involved? Do they have one location? Do they have 12 locations? Do I have six companies to combine financials on? Mm. Uh, do, are there financials in a shoebox? Or do they have audited statements? I've had both. Oh, yeah. Uh, so, we know which ones take more work. <laughs> yes. Uh, so, But most of it is based on a commission. Uh, when the business is sold, we get a percentage of what the seller gets. The larger the sale, the smaller the commission, the, the percentage. Yeah, it's like so, many other businesses. Yeah, it is. There, right. There's a certain amount of work involved with it, but you know, part of I'm gonna 
go back and or digress yeah, cool. once again. Yeah. And I want to talk a little bit about the process because that'll help you understand the exclusivity of it. Go, please do. You know, so we start out, we talk about the business, we value the business, you know, we, we look at it and say, you know, uh, what's the range of value for this? Because value is going to be different depending on who the buyer is. So we give them a range of value. What are the challenges in selling it? Do we, what do we need to clean up before we go to market? But when we finally go to market in this size business, we typically go to market without a price. We try and get multiple buyers so that we can play one against the other. Right. People want, and in a very polite way, but it's not just maximizing the price, it's maximizing choice. Yeah. I've often had clients say, the guy that bid the most money, I don't want to sell to him. He's a jerk. You know, I like this other guy better. So we give them options. So it's a process. It's a very detailed, specific process we go through. And so when we're creating competition, when we're creating an auction, there needs to be one person in charge of that. Mm. And that's us. Yeah. So that, that's kind of our process. And to have two people trying to do the same thing, talking to two different buyers, uh, you know, you, you go to... Uh, Neiman Marcus down here and you can find something you can only get there. That's exclusive. You find another product you can see in six different stores. That's not so special. Right. Same thing with your business. You want to be special. To, uh, only because I've been, I've been in a lot of these conversations, but I would love it for you to talk about those multiple offers and some of the more surprising things you've seen or, or maybe even the generalizations that you've seen. I think you hit on one is a lot of times the highest bidder usually isn't the buyer. No, uh, it isn't. And, no. and tell why though, Jim. Why? Because terms are as important as price. There you go. Um, it's not how much you sell it for, it's how much you end up with after tax. You know, that's what really counts. And there can be a tremendous difference in tax consequences in how you structure a business. So you want those choices. And I just blanked on your question. Well, I, <laughs> I no, 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 it was fine. It was because, I, 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 again, off air, I've had numerous conversations with other trade partners or, you know, people that are in my business specifically about how when they've gone through the process, whether it's your your company or another one, another broker, is how they were surprised how they were just drawn to a buyer. Oh, And yes. then it was, man, I hope that, I hope they are high enough that I can pick them instead of, you know, the highest guy be, or yes. highest gal, because I just don't feel any, I, I like, I don't want to give up my baby to, that to the devil. You know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and I've had people say, no, I won't sell to them. My customers have been with me for 30 years. My employees have been here for decades. I'm not going to stick my friends, customers, and employees with a jerk. Yeah. And, and that guy is a jerk. But you know, that, I'm going to transition from there. There's something that's happening a lot these days, and that is buyers are contacting good businesses directly. Uh, get, they buy databases like I do. So oh. I, I want to buy a, a drywall company. Let's go back to okay. that. I can get a list of the top 10 drywall companies in town. And I'm a buyer. I contact them. And I say, hey, I'm interested in talking to you, JJ, about your business. You know, well, we can just do this deal together. You can save all that money on a broker. Let's just you and I talk about this. That's happening every day. But if you go back to what I said at the beginning, when I represent a buyer, I don't want anybody else involved. I'm there to get it as cheap as I can. Yeah. And a lot of these are professional buyers. You know, and I'll, I'll give you a quick example. I had a gentleman call me and said, hey, my, I've just got a letter of intent on my business. And before I sign it, my lawyer said I should talk to you. I said, <laughs> okay, well, you know, tell me. I said, well, th these people contact me directly. They're in my industry. They're synergistic. I really like them. Uh, and we've negotiated for eight months, finally got a letter of intent for $6 million. And so my lawyer said, I should talk to you. That's what I'm doing. I said, okay, do this. Call them back. 
Tell them that this is the biggest transaction in your life. You want to be professionally represented. Give them my name and tell them I'll call them in about two weeks when I get my arms around the deal. He goes, oh, God, today's Thursday. And a letter of intent expires on Monday. We can't wait two weeks. What, wait. And I said, trust me. Yeah. I've done this for a long time. They've spent eight months negotiating with you. They'll wait. Yeah. Calls the buyer. Gives them the message. The buyer says, oh, God, don't get some damn broker in the middle of this. They just delay things and screw it up. The guy said, no, nope, no, nope. I've decided I want, I want a broker to do this. Um, that's Thursday afternoon. Friday morning, the buyer calls back the seller and says, listen, I don't want this delayed by some damn broker. You leave the broker out of this, and you can make my offer $8 million instead of six. The guy called me and tells me this story and said, it took me eight months to get him to six million. You've been involved for 24 hours and I got two million more. And I, so we ended up selling the business to a different buyer for $10 million. Yep. He thought he had a good deal at six. He liked him. It was a good fit. You, even if you're not dealing with more than one buyer, you want that buyer to think you are. So I would caution people when you get solicited directly, they're going to be the nicest, smoothest talking people. Mm -hmm. It's the biggest transaction in your life. Now, I've also had people come to me with that situation, and I've said, I think they're overpaying you. Take you it. don't need me. Yeah. Grab it and run. Yeah. You know, I'll tell them that. Yeah. So, but, anyway. again, you've, but again, you've met, just like all of us, when, when you reach a level of expertise in, your, in whatever you do, you don't mind saying the truth, right? Because, no. again... Yeah. You've built a brand, you, 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 it's your reputation, all those kind of things. So, I mean, kudos. Um, you talked about that trend, but I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you in the short time left of, all right, Jim, are there any other trends that are going on in the M&A that you see that's either good or bad, other than the direct contact? Yeah, there's. it's like markets going up and down. Values go up and down. Terms go up and down. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, after everything that happened in 2020, when, when uh, 2020, we took half the businesses off the market we were trying to sell. You know, their gross was down 40%. Their net was down 40%. The only thing that wasn't down is their expectation of value. Yeah. So we had to tell them either got to take less money or wait. And the transition from wait from stop to start. When deals are happening then, and there's some carryover with that now, with the volatility in our geopolitical environment, interest rates, you know, values, I'm seeing more deals done with earnouts than I ever have before. Right. And an earnout is a contingent payment in the future. Mm -hmm. and, and as an example, so I, I'm buying your business, and you say you want 12 million, and I say no, it's only worth 10. And so we say, oh, well, but you say it's growing and it's going to double next year, so it's going to be worth it. So I say, JJ, fine, I'll pay you 12, I'll give you 10 million down, and I'll give you the other 2 million you want if the company hits these benchmarks yep. that you guaranteed me they will do. Put your money where your mouth is. Yep. You know, that trend of earnouts, future payment, little more conservative from the buyers, that's fairly common today. Yeah, I would agree. What about the um, what about some of the stats I've heard about the demographics of the boomers? You know that we're not the, you know we had the recession, then we had twenty twenty. This keep kicking the can. Now it's like, listen, you know if you're in your sixties and seventies or whatever, it, it it's there's no more time left. And yep. all this all these small to mid sized cap businesses that are still owned by boomers yep. or their their heirs, if you will. That now we're in that prime spot is I've I've seen some data that kind of is both good and bad. It's like hold it, you've got you've only got a, a, a few years left before it drops off precipitously, and then you're looking at the the amount of capital, if you will, that's over yes. on this side in PEs investment banking going, and it's they're kind of uh, I don't know I would say juxtaposed, but there's some anomalies in there. Where it's it, so the the sellers, um, how do I just phrase this, Jim? The seller's market might only be another two to three years of good, ripe pickings. I don't think it's that long. Okay. I think we're starting a transition today from a seller's market to a buyer's market. There, I'm glad you said it. Uh, the transition is starting. It's subtle. Uh, it will be more drastic by one industry to another. 
But you know, with all the things that have happened over the last three or four years in our economy, there is a lot of money held up in private equity, mm -hmm. a huge capital overhang. That capital overhang is starting to get spent. Mm -hmm. It's coming down. Interest rates are up, as you might have heard a little bit about. Uh, some, I heard some rumor, yeah, I don't know. Some rumor about <laughs> yeah. that. Well, that affects value of a business, yeah. you know. A uh, typical private equity group is going to uh, use about half equity and half borrowed money. They're going to get the same return for their investors. And if the cost of the money they borrow goes up, the value they pay is going to go down. Values are starting to come down. It's turning into a buyer's market from a seller's market. All right, young man, what, uh, what, what's the last piece of advice I can give you or that you can give the audience before uh, we sign off? Think in advance. What? Start, <laughs> think in advance. Start planning ahead of time. But you know, Jim, no one wants to do that. <laughs> they don't, but if you want to maximize your return and your options, yeah. you know, I, I mean, take the guy that's 65 years old two years ago and he had to put off selling. He's now 67. He wants to retire. Well, it's gonna, it may take a year to get the business ready to go to market. Then it may take a year to sell it. Mm -hmm. Now he's got that customer concentration, so he's gonna get an earn out. So the buyer is gonna want him to stay on for two years. You know, you think of putting your business on the market, like putting an ad in the newspaper mm -hmm. to sell your car, you know, you could be one to four years before you're out of there. Think ahead of time. Good. With that, thank you, Jim, for being on today. Um, and then for the audience's sake, again, Jim and Fenwich with uh, IBG and Fox and Finn. Um, they're here in Scottsdale. Uh, I know he's got plenty of partners and colleagues that would be more than happy to take your phone call if, it, if any of what we talked about is of interest to you, either on the buyer or seller side. Um, and just thanks again, Jim. Appreciate your knowledge. You're, uh, you know, I know you're just a rookie at this, but, uh, you know, it was nice that you shared those stories. So I don't know where an hour went so quickly, but I, I just really appreciate you coming on. So Thanks thank for you. having me, JJ. I appreciate it. Any of your, you know, audience has any questions, have them give me a call, follow up. Uh, as you can tell, I don't charge to talk and I'm not bashful. <laughs> All right. Thanks again, Jim. Thank you, JJ. You've been listening to the Mac and Blue Show, brought to you by Blue Wave General Contracting. Be sure to subscribe to the Mac and Blue podcast on your favorite podcast platform. Follow JJ Levensky on LinkedIn and Instagram. Tune in every Monday 